Good morning. As always, an honor and a blessing to be before you today, an honor and a blessing to have gone and spent the day with our students and to have had fun with them yesterday, to have seen them attempt to do things that they've never done before and to see them succeed, to see them struggle and to see them recognize the importance and the significance of getting things done in the right order. I'm not talking about making hamburgers, though that could be a good example of that as well, but I really can't help but go back to the way that I saw these students, some of them for the very first time, get out of the water on skis. And if you've ever skied before, then you know that there was a moment in your past at some point where it felt like no matter what you did, it just wasn't right. You lean back, you lean forward, you hold close, you let your arms out, you do strong legs or weak legs, all these different things. You keep your feet together, they got to be shoulder width apart. All of these different things were shouted from the boat yesterday. And a lot of them didn't even come from me. Now I think for me it's tough because like I learned how to ski early. Snoopy skis, one with Snoopy, one with... Woodchuck or that, what isn't that right? Woodchuck, yeah. Woodstock, golly, I had that yesterday. See, I, 45, all goes downhill. Not quite, next month. But still, you get the point. So uh, you get to that point where like, you, for me, it, it becomes kind of old hat. I learned how to ski when I was three years old. I, I had the Snoopy skis. They were tied together so your feet couldn't go too far apart. They pulled me off of like this wonderful, um, like, you know, fake grass, astroturfy kind of stuff. And you just kind of held on and they pulled and they would pull you right out in the water and everything was great. We, we, we had amazing, amazing opportunities yesterday. None of these people were three. But boy, they learned very quickly that it really is about keeping the first things first. You don't get out of the water on a set of skis until you have like the foundational stuff done. That over under grip and making sure that your knees are bent but not too bent. That your feet are close but not too close. That your back is strong and that your core is tight and all these things. But that all seems like a a ethereal set of recommendations until you happen to get it in the right order at the right time. And you allow the boat to do what it has to do first. Because no matter how hard you pull, if the boat is not moving, you are not getting out of the water. I do think that Dennis Abercrombie had a good time yesterday. Not merely because he was with us and around all these wonderful students, but because he was kind of the guy in charge of the ski boat. And there is a little bit of like that, (laughs) that kind of comes in, you know. But he encouraged and he cared and he loved for those kids in amazing ways. And his instruction and my instruction Scarlet's instruction and James's instruction. By the way, you want to see some kids ski, get the Cofields out on the water. Blow your mind. It was good stuff. I was proud of them. They were amazing. But you got to get it all in the right order. And I know that your immediate thought is, Jeremy, skiing's not in the Bible. Duh. Right? It's not. Skiing's not in the Bible. But there's countless places where we recognize the need to keep things in the right order. To have our priorities set in a way that makes sure that God is honored above everything else. And we find that, conveniently, in the book of Haggai. For those of you who have not read it, quit slacking. It's two chapters. It's good stuff. And there's a lot that we learn in the midst of this book. We wind up seeing that God's blessing is consistent and present. That God is at work in ways that we could never imagine. And so you have a general understanding of where we're at. The people of Israel have gotten released from their time in captivity in Babylon. They've come back to the land that they were promised and they've been given the instruction to rebuild, to make things the way that they need to be. But here's where trouble strikes. 
They had initially started on getting the wall and the temple and everything else put together. And they decided that, that though those things were important, they really, really needed to have their houses together first. And so they built their own houses. And then they began to plant vineyards. And they began to have hope and expectation for the grapes, which would lead to the wine, which was a blessing. And all of these things were happening. And in the midst, they forgot that they needed to get back to the temple and to the wall. They were given instructions and they fell short of those instructions because they got caught up, they got lost in seeking their own will, their own way, their own desire, setting their own priorities and making what they desired above what God desired in their planning and in their application. And I think one of the things that we find first and foremost in Haggai is that proper priorities matter. We see that play out in the first few verses. You'll see it on the screen. Haggai 1, 2b through 6. This is where the Word of God. These people say... The time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while the house lies in ruin? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. See, the people of Israel had gotten so distracted so intentionally focused on what they wanted and perceived that they needed, that they set aside God's desire, God's focus, God's call, and the instruction that God had given them. And I don't know about you, I mean, I can th certainly think of places in my life other than just behind a ski boat where I have decided that what Jeremy wanted was far more significant than what God wanted. And in every one of those instances, I've been brought back to the recognition, the realization that God needs to be first. He needs to be first in my life. He needs to be first in my family. He needs to be first in our church. He needs to be first among our leadership. He needs to be what we place our focus on 100% of the time. I don't know what's going on. We're going to flip this around a little bit and see if that helps, and maybe it will. Hmm. We place our focus on the sounds that the microphone makes, and it distracts us. When in reality, we should be placing our focus upon the God that has created us and given us freedom and given us instruction and intended us to live out the example that he sets for us in Christ. To be the hands and the feet, to be that living example of what God looks like to a world that needs it. And listen, in the book of Haggai, they had the promise of the coming Messiah, but they had the example set forth in God's word. And they had the instruction given by prophets. Haggai was not the first. He was not the last. He may have been minor, but he was not the least. And Haggai's instruction to the people was that they needed to get done what God had told them to do. You see, when we get out of sorts and out of order in our lives, when we place what we want and said ahead of what God wants, we find that we fall short and that our needs, our desires are left unfulfilled. And we really get a sense of that in these first couple of verses, how they've sown much and harvested little, how they've eaten but they're never full, how they drink but they never get their fill, how they're clothed but they're not warm, 
how they earn wages, but it's like they put them into bags with holes in them. Listen, if this sounds like where you are right now in your life, the question you have to ask, that you have to ask, have to ask, we'll get it right, words, that you have to ask yourself is, are you prioritizing God over yourself? Are you a person that believes that God is faithful to the point that you make him the most important thing because he is the most important thing? Because when we get out of sorts and we get out of order, we shortchange. When we get out of sorts and get out of order, we miss the blessing. And in many ways, we forfeit it. Only when we keep God in his rightful position, only when we give God the glory that he deserves, And only when our efforts are dedicated to meet the expectation, the plan, and the purpose of God, does everything else fall into place properly. I get it. It can be tough. Beyond tough, sometimes it feels like it's absolutely contradictory. Because we think that our view is the only one that matters. And in reality, our view must be subjective to God's. Our effort, our striving, our focus, and the time that we spend must be subjected to God. It's not merely about proper priorities. It's about the recognition that we never complete tasks alone. That though we may feel that like the entirety of, of our responsibility, of the job that we have, of our family, of the church, of whatever it may be, falls on our shoulders. I can assure you, if the entirety of that weight was on any of us, we would be crushed. So when we feel like it's up to us and us alone, what we wind up doing, when we attempt to take control, what we wind up doing is that we take on something we're never meant to bear. We attempt to make ourselves like God, and I don't mean that in the good way. When instead, we're intended to let God be the one who not only holds everything that we carry, but that holds us in the palm of his hand. Because he is capable. We see that begin to play out in verse 3. Hear the word. Who was left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. These are people of high standing. These are people of significance. These are leaders amongst God's people. And these are leaders who have begun to forfeit what it is that God has called them to because they worry more about what they want than meeting what God deserves. They fall short. And to be frank, we do too sometimes. We fall short. Theologian John D. Barry notes that Haggai is addressing Zerubbabel and Joshua, reassuring them with a message that promises Yahweh's presence. He notes that even though the temple, as it was at that point in time, appeared inadequate in comparison to Solomon's temple, that the people are intended to recognize that Yahweh assures them that his glory will be present just as it was for the earlier temple in the day and age of Haggai. You guys ever looked around and thought, man, this is not what I expected. I pray that does not happen here on a regular basis. 
But have you done that in your lives? Like you look around and you think, gosh, I really thought that I would be doing something more. I thought that I would have more. I thought that this place would be different. I thought that, that my kids would be nicer. I don't know, whatever it may be. I'm not suggesting that's my design. My kids are fantastic. Have you met them? I'm joking. They are great, but they're also human, right? They're going to fall short sometimes. But we all have like these hopes and expectations. And beyond that, it's like the J.G. Wentworth commercial, you know. It's my money and I want it now, right? We want what we want and we want it now. We don't have any patience. Yet God tells us that if we are faithful, that if we are willing, that if we are submitting to him, that even though things might not be what we want them to be right now, that we have the promise that God's plan and purpose will be fulfilled in God's time. I go back and I think about the skiing yesterday. And how awesome it was to see some of our students who have never gotten out of the water on skis get out of the water. And even if they only went like 10 or 15 feet like that, if you've ever done it, you know that's a big deal the first time you're able to do that. They got a taste of what, of what skiing looks like, of what it feels like, of the excitement that comes with the water splashing in your face and being drugged behind a boat at 25 miles an hour. They got all that. But they also have in that taste the opportunity to long for more. It's the reason that the ones who fell early got back on and tried again and tried again and tried again because they wanted to get to a place where they could experience the fullness of what it was to ski. And I would argue that a lot of that's what we wind up seeing unfold in the people of Israel in the northern kingdom, as they've returned from Babylon. But the difference is that when these people came home, it's almost like they got completely content with just a taste that they forgot that there was this promise of so much more. That there was a promise of more. We're intended to be a people that understand that God's work and God's presence and God's will and God's desire and God's covenant, and all of those things are about far more than just today. And they're about far more than just yesterday. They're intended to draw us to have hope in our future. Because God's plan is being fulfilled every single day. And we're not intended to run ahead and we're not intended to lag behind. We're instead intended to go in step with God. Because when we go at God's pace, when we fulfill God's command, when we allow God to lead instead of us to lead, we see that we are protected and made safe, that we are given what we need in that moment. It is like manna in the desert and we have what we need daily. God's promise is real. It's not merely about priority. It's not merely about the fact that we do not seek to accomplish these things alone. It's about the recognition that there is a definitive difference between that which is holy and that which is defiled. And I know some of you are thinking, well, God, yeah, that makes sense. But do you understand the difference between that which is holy and that which de is defiled? Because Haggai gives us this beautiful representation in the second chapter, verses 12 through 19. It's a lot, but hear this. 
If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. And then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with the dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, it does become unclean. And then Haggai answered and said to him, so is it with the people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then consider from this day onward before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one comes to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat that drew 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. I considered from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, the olive tree have yielded nothing, but from this day on I will bless you. I told you it's a lot, but it's going to boil down to something pretty simple. Holiness begets holiness, and defilement begets defilement. The only way that we are able to be a holy people is because we serve a holy God who gives us his righteousness in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, not because of anything we can do on our own, not even because we do everything to the letter of the law, but because of the blood of Christ. See, we have a different perspective of this, right? I mean, we're, we're like 2,500 and change years later. We know about Jesus coming and living and dying and being resurrected. We know the message that he taught. But these people had the law and they were dedicated, should have been, dedicated to following the law of living out what it was to be the people of God because they allowed him to structure their lives. They kept the main thing, the main thing. They set aside their desire, their want, their time frame, their expectations, and instead they lived fully and wholly with the place of God in the forefront of their minds. That God gave them everything. It's not merely about priestly regulation <laughs> or even ag agricultural imagery, as Barry suggests. The point of this is to recognize that the success of what we do is held in the palm of God's hand. And God desires our faithfulness because he is faithful. And it is only when we are holy as God is holy, when we are faithful as God is faithful, that we receive the fullness of the blessing that God promises us. It's really, really easy to defile things. We defile things by being defiled and coming into contact with other stuff. He lays this out. It's different when things are made holy. Things are made holy by God. And God has a desire and a plan and a purpose for this place. And he has a desire and a plan and a purpose for every single one of you in these seats and all of you that are watching online. And that desire and that plan and that purpose is for his will and for his word and for his way to be greater than our own. Because the only way that we receive the fullness of God's blessing is when we quit thinking that the blessing is tied to our effort alone. There's nothing any of us in this room can do that exceeds what Christ has done. There's nothing that any of us can put in in the terms of effort or time that exceeds God's creative power and might. 
There is nothing in the world that any of us independently are able to accomplish if God does not allow it to happen. You see, on one hand, I think Haggai's message to Zerubbabel and to Joshua and to the people of Israel was about accomplishing what God has set forth for them. But on the other hand, it was about letting go so that God can accomplish it. So here's my question for you today. What are you trying to control? What are you trying to hold on to? What are you trying to finesse or to change or to shape or to form? And is it yours to do so with? Or are we intended to be a people that recognize that God is the great creator, that God is the great shaper, that God has a plan and a purpose and a timing that is perfect again and again and again? So this morning as we head into communion, I remind you of what was mentioned earlier in the service. Perhaps during this time of worship, as you come down to take your communion, maybe you need to set some things down. Maybe you need to set aside the stuff in your life that you think that you have control of. Maybe you need to quit like pulling too hard. Maybe you need to quit letting go too quickly. Maybe you need to quit doing these things that put you in the driver's seat and instead allow God to drive the ship. Because I can assure you of this. In my life, time and time and time again, when I felt like it was about what I could do, when I felt like it was about the things that I could make happen, I came to the realization that my effort was fruitless. I came to the point where I recognized oftentimes to my own detriment that it is only when God is in the driver's seat, when God is in control, that things work out as God desires them to. So may we be a people that do our part, but nothing more. Amen and amen.